Today, the RLS boys bring you another Bring Your Own Topic Day. Roshan kicks us off with a consideration of possible stock selection lessons in William Thorndike's 2012 book, The Outsiders, Eight Unconventional CEOs and Their Radically Rational Blueprint for Success. Adrian then walks us through his dialogue with an online artificial intelligence chat tool, a technology that is writing everything from blog posts to travel guides to even distressed cries for help. Eric concludes with a tip to protect enough of your IRA from Roth conversion so that you can use it for all your charitable giving after age 70 and a half. Doing so could save you big time on taxes. Stay tuned as we discuss all this and more right now on the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I'm your co-host, Roshan Langani. We've got the gang back together. Uh, Adrian Nicholson is with us, and Eric Olson is fresh from his conference. Welcome back, Eric. Thank you. Good good times. It sounds like you guys had a good time, too. Yeah, we, we had a, a an excellent podcast without you. you. You can give us your feedback if you have a chance to, to check it out. <laughs> Probably an improvement. <laughs> Adrian, how are you? How is your how's your week been? My week's been good. I'm happy, Eric. You're back. It's always good when you're you take a little bit of a break and you come back fresh and ready for a new podcast. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say today. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Likewise, today's bring your own topic day. I'm excited about that. As am I. It's always a an interesting uh topics that we bring from different different areas and different realms. I think it reflects uh, somewhat what's going on, what we've read, what we're interested in. And gentlemen, if you don't mind, I will I will kick it off. By all means, yep. let's go ahead, it. Roshan. Looking forward to so it. So as we yeah, as we discussed reading uh, our dis- this topic, I'm in the middle of a book called The Outsiders, Eight Unconventional CEOs and their radically rational blueprint for success by William Thorndike. And uh, as I've talked before, I'm usually constantly uh, uh, in the middle of some type of investment book. This book was actually referenced in a variety of uh, investment books, which is how I how I found it, and uh, was really interested to look into it. And I'd love your love your feedback. I'll give you some of the bullet points. And where I see the value in this for everyone that's listening is I think this is something that you can look at adding to or uh, adding to your research when you're looking for any type of uh, investment or stock that you'll look to invest in or company you'll look to invest in. I think some of these traits when you're looking for CEO uh, and management's background and track record will be will be useful. So I'll just give you a few of the uh, few of the bullet points, and I'd love your feedback, and we can discuss it as we get through each each one. So the the first one is the CEO's main job is capital allocation. So if I'm investing in your company, I want to make sure that wherever you're investing within the firm, there are good opportunities. If it's acquisitions, they're bought at a good price. If it's investing, uh, in expanding a division, wherever you're spending those dollars, I want to make sure that as a shareholder, it's getting returns back to me. So the CEO's main job is capital allocation. Gentlemen, any thoughts on that? Agree, disagree, first time you're hearing it, what what do you think? Well, that is interesting. I guess it's funny the way that you framed it. I'm still, I'm even just curious about why the book is titled The Outsiders as opposed to something else. I, I'm sure you'll come back to that. Mm-hmm. But just on that one narrow question, I would say, I guess I've thought of the CEO as more an ambassador of the company to the world, who's uh, trying to communicate to the world what it is that the company is attempting to accomplish, as well as in some ways a brand ambassador, and as well as well at some high level, a, a, strat, a st- strategist, but in terms of getting too micro, while trying to make sure that all the players in the other functional um, groupings, finance, marketing, and so manufacturing and so forth are all on the same page and communicating and functioning well together in a healthy way, that that CEO isn't necessarily the one who is sort of doing the deeper analytical work to find where's the best way to app- allocate capital. Unless you're thinking about it in a very macro sense of 
hey, we should go that direction rather than that direction as a company. So well, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, well, first, as far as uh, why it's titled what it is, unconventional CEOs and their radical blueprint for success. Um, mm -hmm. First, the book's uh, theory is the best way to measure a CEO is by uh, increase in the per share of value during their tenure. Right. And I, I make that point because uh, being the ambassador, which is what a lot of people think in particular, when you think about like a Jack Welch CEO, uh, you know, that, that's sort of out, out there and in, in front of the company, they're sort of the figurehead or face of the company. Um, that does not necessarily make the best CEO once again, as the argument of the book, and as an investor, I'd I'd weigh the shareholder per share value increase higher. But the other thing um, you had, you had mentioned, though, just actually going back to the title, and then I'll go back to capital allocation, is it says they rely on independent thinking over expert opinion, and so I think that goes into the title as far as unconventional CEOs uh, and the how deep they're in on capital allocation, they tend to run very decentralized organization. so, uh, organizations. So if you're, if you're running your division, uh, like uh, they talk about uh, Malone in the, uh, in the media space, John Malone, and uh, him just expanding the med his media empire, being there when the cable companies were running, and they were at each individual outlet, you know, starting with, with uh, networks and stations, they would do deep budget discussions with them annually. But aside from that, as long as you were hitting your targets, you ran your shop. So they weren't, and then you returned your, the cash flow to the, to the mothership, so to speak. And then they would allocate it where they thought was best, whether that was acquisitions, share buybacks, or, you know, investing within those divisions. You had to, uh, if you wanted them to do any kind of capital expenditures, you had to make a case of um, uh, of what type of returns you're going to get, so it was all bottom line. What kind of returns are you are you going to get with the company or for the company for the shareholders? So, I think I'll, I'll go on to the next one. But I think the uh, capital allocation is is something different from what 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 you typically think about, and that's why I think the title is unconventional CEOs. Here's um. Uh, well, before another, you leave it, so yeah. let me just set this tr then make sure that my thinking is clear, and maybe the listeners are are th thinking along these same lines. So when you say capital allocator, it is not. I was envisioning it as much more of a micro role. You're you're saying no. If anything, it's less more of a hands off role. It's just broad sort of direction of where where does the next opportunity lie, or what's the next major problem that we need to solve. And let's direct the aggregated cash flows from all these underlying sources uh, in this with these, you know, this or that set of priorities. Yeah, yes. It, it, and and I, it, yes, in the priorities, but almost even higher level in the sense that uh, the priority may have nothing to do with running running the business. It's not an operational use of capital. It's more mm -hmm. of where you're going to deploy the capital the business generates. Okay. And then in that sense, how would it, to the extent that the book touches on this, how would the book then characterize what most conventional CEOs do if that's what he argues, he or she argues that um, unconventional CEOs are more inclined to do? Well, to give an example on the share buybacks, for example, the mm -hmm. conventional CEO will do buybacks because they look good for their comp for the company and they'll do it regardless of price stock price the unconventional ceo will do buybacks only if the stock price is attractive interesting okay would the same thing apply then to other forms of returning value to shareholders such as dividends uh, uh yes it, it definitely will a lot of the 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 um ceos profiled uh didn't return uh, capital to often via dividends because they were also focused on tax efficiency. And uh, they go through in the book uh, uh, multiple CEOs that were at uh, General Dynamics when they covered, they covered the company. Uh, and I'm looking for which one it was because they actually covered it. It was three different CEOs that, uh, that did this. But one thing that was really interesting was uh, 
when they sold a division and they hired a team of uh, tax experts to find the most efficient way to return that money to cap uh, to investors, mm-hmm. and they were mm-hmm. able to do it as a return of capital, so investors didn't have to pay tax on it. And mm-hmm. uh, they talk a lot about the frugality of the CEOs. They don't want to. They want to spend as little as they as they can on almost anything. There's a story that's made it into multiple books about uh, Tom Murphy, who is Capital City CEO, and you know later had uh, ABC, which he then sold to to Disney. But there's a story about. Uh, they told him that his building looked old, so it needed to be painted. Well, he only painted the two sides that faced the road. He didn't paint the other <laughs> two sides, right? So, yeah. um, so as far as dividends and returning capital, the focus is tax efficiency. So that's mm-hmm. one reason you don't you don't pay a dividend is because it's it's uh, not very tax efficient. Another, if you're a good allocator, another reason to not pay a dividend is because you can invest that money better in most cases than your shareholder can, Mm -hmm. right? So you've got the greater tax benefit and then you've got your expertise of allocating capital. Well, that raises for me, uh, uh, just as a note, we should have an an entire uh, episode, I think sometime on just the whole concept of returning uh, capital to shareholders, buybacks, dividends, and so forth, and comparing those, not only comparing them one to another, but comparing them over time. The reason yeah. I wanted to pursue that line of questioning with you, Roshan, was because it does sort of fly in the face of the other argument that we entertained together about six weeks ago, which is the dividend growth strategy. So the, the argument made by the dividend growth camp is, is that, wait a second, no, it, it's those CEOs that indeed are deeply focused on making sure that they do consistently return capital to shareholders in the form of dividends that demonstrates the kind of corporate disposition that seems to be associated with lasting companies. The book you're you're, um, describing for us is arguing, I think, a slightly different approach or taking a different approach and saying, no, the the successful CEO is not the one who has this sort of invariable commitment to returning capital in the form of dividends or buybacks, but instead is saying, we'll do that when it's opportune as a company to do that, but we won't at other times. Well, if you think about it from a tax perspective, it's, for me personally, it's more efficient for my life to be able to choose when I sell a stock and pay the tax. Oh, I completely versus agree with that. Versus getting the dividend and, and you deciding when I, pay, when, I, when I pay the tax. But completely going back to what agree. we covered last, uh, last time on the dividend, uh, dividend growth investing, I, I, don't, I don't think you have to be exclusively focused on one or the other. Uh, you know, we we also talked a couple of weeks ago on uh, the Art of Investing series that we did where I went over uh, different uh, ways that we're looking for finding finding stocks to invest in. Uh, I, lo- I don't look for dividends, but I also don't reject something that pays a dividend. So I'm not screening for or against dividend. I'll take it or I, or I won't take it based on the company. Well, just to clarify, in this case, I was not making the distinction or make, trying to highlight the contrast between a return of capital in the form of stock buybacks or a return of capital or, or a distribution of capital in the form of dividends. I was that, That's not the contrast of interest that I thought you were highlighting from the book. I thought the contrast was is that a CEO will, um, at times, a, a, an unconventional CEO will at times say, this is a 2023 is a good year to return capital to shareholders. And maybe it's more efficient to do that with a stock buyback. I think we'd agree that. But 2024 might be a year in which we don't return money to shareholders in either buybacks or in dividends or any other form. So is just that seems to me to be that the contrast between the dividend growth companies and the sorts of CEO outlooks that you're describing here. Well, yeah, if you take the years out of there and you you replace mm-hmm. that with our stock is cheap right now, so let's buy okay. it this uh-huh. year, right? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. the approach and to me that makes a lot of sense, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the oh, yeah. the other way the other way by the way with this is in general um a, a lot of times you'll get they'll use the share the their stock as a tool. So when they're acquiring a company, if their stock is selling at really high multiples, they'd go and acquire a company with stock versus cash. Mm -hmm. Uh, In general, I think they would lean more towards cash for acquisitions than stock, but it's an intelligent move. As I was going through this now, uh, Jeff Bezos is not uh, a subject of this book. This book is from 2012, but it does also remind me of a lot of what he did with Amazon. 
right? When they were doing acquisitions, they were buying uh, with share the shares and they were selling it at huge multiples. His focus along the way from the beginning was minimizing taxes. So a lot uh, with Amazon in particular, you couldn't really value them with conventional methods because they always looked expensive. Well, what he was doing was just being uh, intelligent with the with the tax code. Right. So I, I think you look at that as a strategic move. Uh, and um, uh, I talked about uh, John Malone, uh, CEO earlier. Well, he was against um, having multiple layers of uh, management and staff. He liked to be like to be lean. One of the things he would splurge on was uh, he had a uh, tax uh, management team. So we hired them full time. That was their job to make sure the business was run in a tax efficient way. And he thought it was so important that he would go to all the meetings. So they would meet once a, once a month, they said, and he'd go there. So just going back to this conversation uh, started with dividends versus dividend growth strategy, d- uh, buybacks versus dividends and returning capital to shareholders. Um, I just like the efficient use of capital. Mm-hmm. Right. Here, so here. and I do think that that dividends are less efficient at the same time. Mm-hmm. There Agreed. is history behind dividend growth investment strategies doing well. And there are investors, the particularly retirees who are living off dividends that need the income. So I don't think dividends mm-hmm. are, are bad. It's the, the right uh, having them in the right place uh, mm-hmm. and right part of your portfolio. So I'm not saying a CEO that that that. Uh, pays dividends or pays high dividends or doing a bad a bad thing for the shareholders by any means. All right. Well, listen, uh, Roshan, you've been very kind to let me pose a lot of questions. I do have another question and you can kick it down until later in the episode, but if you wish to, totally fine, but I'll just pose it now. And then if you don't want to deal with it, just, just we'll, we'll address it later. But one of the things you said that just really uh, sparked my, a thought within me is that you pointed out that one of the things that it it's useful to a, a company to see the appreciation of their stock price or to make it expensive in some ways because number one it permits them to then use stock as as an acquiring tool it's a strategic tool for them that mm-hmm. way it also then strikes me that it may serve um, to do one other thing and that is to be a strategic obstacle because if it is if you know if in some level there they're expensive, then maybe it makes them less appealing as a as a uh, um, acquisition target themselves. W- when that is when that's true at the time, and that a potential acquirer, especially if it's hostile, would want to wait until such a time as they were cheap, which they they can forestall that. <laughs> maybe that's useful to them. The third way that it strikes me is might be interesting is this. In the past, we had Jason Meyer from Eventide Investments as a guest on our show. And one of the things that we were asking him was about the way in which investors who have a values-based investing approach can express that in a secondary market. We, we certainly understand that if I allocate the company in a primary market, meaning the company's not yet gone public and I hand them a check, so they now have at the co- corporate level, they now have money they didn't have the day before that they can now go deploy in whatever their corporate mission is. But in the secondary market, meaning I'm buying a stock of the, that company from somebody else, when I purchase that stock from somebody else, that check then doesn't go to that company to help them advance their mission. It's just an, it's a trade that's occurring between an existing owner and a new owner. And I've always wondered to what extent that is really influential in sending a signal to the corporate heads about how to reform their behavior if I'm not pleased with it or conversely if i'm super pleased with it how does that how does that how do i signal that to them and jason's argument at the time was when you make purchases or sales in the secondary market at a collective level what that does is sends a signal that validates for the ceo and the leadership team whether or not what they're doing is well received by the public and should they should do more of it or the opposite well you just showed me that there's actually more than just a symbolic effect there there's actually potentially a, a tangible effect of that. If you like what they're doing and you you purchase, you create more demand for their stock, such that that collectively helps to con, to the stock price to rise, all else being equal, you've now equipped them with a tool that they can use to go out and acquire other companies using their their stock to do more of what they're doing. And in, in, said differently, in an, in a, in a 
maybe slightly less direct way, you have equipped them to advance their mission. I love that. Uh, yeah. I completely agree with what you said. You have you've helped them. And if you like the company and you're buying them, you want you want to help them in advancing their mission advances your capital as an investor. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Well, anyway, good. Now, I'm, I'm more excited about in, uh, the consequences of investing in the secondary market than I was 10 minutes ago. Thank okay. you, Roshan. <laughs> Oh, you're very welcome. I've got two more bullet points I want to go over, and then and then I will pass on the topic to either you or Adrian. Uh, one is uh, long term values are determined by cash flow, not reported earnings. And this was a is an interesting and important one because it, it was actually a brand new concept in the seventies and eighties. So you think it's just a, a fifty year old thing? The point being, you pay tax on earnings, but you can expand and grow on cash flow. So if you have the opportunity to invest within your company um, that, and that will lower your earnings, you should do so, uh, as opposed to focus on hitting an earnings target or, or something, something like that. And as an investor, once again, if I'm a long-term investor, buy and hold, I want you to lower your tax bill because then you're, you're, ex you're doing a better job investing for me, right? You're, you're, there's less um, friction there in terms of the, the capital being used. Mm -hmm. The last bullet point, uh, it says um, they typically were very patient in terms of uh, acquisitions, but when the opportunity arise, they could make the move very quickly. So what that essentially means, they have criteria for what they're looking for. They wouldn't necessarily deviate from it. They wouldn't, and they would just wait for the opportunity. And when I compare this to investing in the stock market is, uh, this reminds me a lot of, I think back to Warren Buffett in uh, 2008, that he, he literally deployed billions of dollars in days. And prior to that, for years, he's just sitting on cash. Right. And it's what puts him in a position to deploy that much capital that quickly. It's all of his experience and also his patience prior. Uh, he has to you have to have the cash in order to deploy it. Right. So his patience of sitting on cash to take advantage of those opportunities. So that's uh, the last thing on here that you see with with the uh, CEOs, the common traits with these CEOs. Really quickly, I'll mention one last thing and then we'll move on. I did look into uh, briefly, okay, well, how can I use this? Is there a, a, a quantitative way to use this? And unfortunately, I wasn't able to find one. There has been a, a lot of research done on founder CEOs and founder CEO outperformance to the point there's a uh, fund out there, an ETF out there that focuses on, on that. And mm. that fund has actually underperformed. Okay. Right. So so what, what I've what I've learned so far from from this is here are these traits, but uh, this is something I'll find out in my research phase. I cannot necessarily find this out in my screening phase. I wonder on that founder's question, if there's if it's conf if it's um, masking some other variables, uh, if if you said what would on balance be more characteristic of companies led by founders than those that are not? Well, one thing is they're probably younger because uh, you, you clearly haven't seen a company then reach the multi-generational stage if the founder is still in place. So I think if you could control for all else being equal um, at, at a certain stage of, uh, you know, in terms of its, since its inception as a company or other sorts of controls that you impose there, then I wonder if that variable is, is useful. It's possible. And I think, I, and I did mention this on my screen that I do look for uh, ownership, inside ownership, but mm -hmm. the founder piece in particular, uh, as I was trying to take what I've read in a book and translate that into what, well, what can I actually use from an investment perspective there? The, as I said, there is data founder outperformance, but I, I just can't find uh, uh so I went and found the fund that, that invests in founders. I went and looked through the holdings, looking for things that were, that were uh, undervalued, which in general was tough to find. And the few that I found that were undervalued uh, were not um, 
showing the return on capital numbers I was looking for. And part of it could be, Eric, as you described, it could be at an early phase. So it just won't meet that criteria. For me, what that meant was I'm not going to spend more time researching this because of uh, uh, there are other mm-hmm. opportunities out there. Mm-hmm. Do okay, you ever enough, get... There was one other thing... Um, uh, go ahead, Eric. I just had one question for us. No, you, Adrian, you go ahead. Well, do you ever get concerned where a CEO kind of just takes on the whole face of a company where, let's just say, a company's very well run, but their CEO just seems a little bit larger than life and whatever the CEO does, if they get fired, if they do something, let's just say, stupid in a way, it just really just impacts the company where the company at the end of the day is a well-run company, but the CEO has seemed to take on a sort of persona that impacts us. That's something that investors really should just be more aware of now, just how the media is, just with how communication just really just breaks the barriers of per- people's personal lives as well. It's just something that has come to mind that can be really concerning if you have a really good stock, but the CEO is a little bit of a wild card, so to speak. Yeah. I, and so. In the book, they talk about how, and the analogy he uses, he says that uh, a lot of these CEOs treat analysts like Bill Belichick would treat reporters, like they're almost (laughs) annoyed to have to answer the questions. So uh, these CEOs, one of the traits in common is they weren't really the uh, the trying to foot push the figurehead face of the organization. They weren't really trying to get their own level of fame. They were focused on on the business and and viewed that as almost a, a waste of time. So uh, I I don't think though, Adrian, I wouldn't necessarily just avoid a company like as you as you went through your question. Elon Musk comes to mind for for me. Like he literally was on Saturday Night Live a couple of years ago, uh, and there. I've heard famous investors literally say they wouldn't invest with him uh, and they don't like him. And for some of the reasons that, that you just described, you know, you go, he just had his uh, his uh, uh, SEC hearing, I believe, for when he when he talked about taking the company public via tweet or private via tweet. So uh, at the same time, you have these these traits that don't fall in line with what you're looking for. But he also uh, is the richest man in the world or was the richest man in the world. He's been overtaken at this point. So uh, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't think I would view that. It might be something I don't like, but it might, be some, might still mean I can uh, uh, invest in it and make a lot of money and grow my portfolio with, with someone like that. Mm-hmm. Thanks for answering that. <coughs> so Roshan, yeah. uh, Adrian, did you have another question? Because if not, I have another question for Roshan. Oh, go ahead, Eric. I'm happy to answer it, but I've gone oh, twice. I've doubled my the time allotted to me. So please, Eric, go ahead and ask it, and I'll try to be quick with the answer. <laughs> no, I think I doubled the time allotted to you <laughs> by asking all these questions. <laughs> so you can play me, and we can we can uh, abbreviate mine. But the the part I guess I don't get uh, is your second point now. So I'm sort of fixed on that one. This is a book about unconventional CEOs, the outsiders, and it's making presumably a contrast with their behavior between their behavior and that of conventional CEOs, the the insiders. And and so you said that the the book is arguing for the the value of cash flow directed within the business before it hits earnings. I'm I guess I'm not just I, I guess I'm not seeing that seems to me to be a fairly typical behavior, whether conventional or unconventional, outsider or insider. People are going to say, we we start with cash flow because we've made sales more than our costs. And now what do we do with it? Maybe we have some expenses inside the business that we want to fund or we want to grow before it, it, we let it out the door and be distributed to shareholders as, as uh, you know, in earnings of some kind or that it's taxed at the corporate level. What what is it that his argument is? Is it a is it a he or a she that's written this book? Sorry, uh, it's a he. Uh, that's William Thorndike is the author. Oh, you said that earlier. I apologize. Yeah. Yes. No, no so problem. Thorndike's argument in this case is uh, is that the the unconventional CEOs are doing something differently in that respect. So, well, for one, they they're a looking back uh, at history. So this mm-hmm. was not necessarily very conventional. Uh, they actually give credit to uh, John Malone, who's you know, now the chair of uh, Liberty Media, for mm-hmm. 
EBITDA being something to look at. So what he what he found out, and he was his his era and his growth was as uh, pay television cable TV was was taking off, and he his um, the biggest cost was paying for content. So he found that, you know, the more subscribers you have, you can negotiate to get a better deal as far as what you're paying, paying for content. So to mm-hmm. expand, you've got to get more subscribers, spend money on that, and then spend money on content, and then you can drive the content down. So he's given credit for having people focus on EBITDA in the, uh, uh, in the 70s, right? So what makes it, what makes it so, uh, so different is that it is used more often now. But you also still have a lot of CEOs that are focused on earnings and hitting specific earnings targets. So he was going out to people uh, and trying to shift their thinking and saying, no, that doesn't matter. Here's what cash flow matters. So part of the answer to your question is I think that the time frame they're profiling is looking at historical CEOs going back to where some of these things weren't done. Uh, you know, th- he, th- he talks about one uh, CEO, uh, Singleton. Uh, gosh, I believe it was Henry Singleton, but he uh, he was doing um, stock buybacks uh, back then. And back then you had to do it via tender offers. So they're giving him credit for uh, being a pioneer with stock buybacks as well as being a pioneer with spinoffs, stuff that we look at as just used all the time and commonplace now. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. part of it is the book and the time frame, but I don't think it's not applicable today. I do think mm. you can look at it today and you can see that that the there are CEOs that are more focused on hitting their guidance measures where mm-hmm. it might be to their company's benefit to reinvest in a way to minimize taxes and focus on cash flows. Hmm. Well, okay, that's interesting. When was the book published? Uh, it, was, it wasn't published that long ago, but it does go back 2012. 2012. And um, given the the most recent 10 books on business or investing that you've read, where does it rank in that in that group of 10? I, I, from uh, for a business book, I'd say pretty high. It doesn't it mm-hmm. doesn't really focus on the investing side side. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I was recently reading. Uh, I think I even mentioned it on the podcast. A book on Munger, and he described reading business biographies as being able to sort of live the journey of that business. So mm-hmm. I think this is very valuable in um, in uh, living a specific part of that journey with the CEOs. So you can, mm-hmm. you can mm-hmm. understand what they went through. So it's just a mm-hmm. chapter or two dedicated to each company. So you don't get the whole story, mm-hmm. but you do get mm-hmm. the, the, what the CEO was working on, how they got to that point, their thought process. So I think it's very valuable. I would definitely recommend it. All right. Well, good. I love, I love your book report. Oh, thank it's you very much. Being back in school. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian, what you got? My topic's on artificial intelligence, which is something that I'm sure a lot of investors have been hearing a lot about. It's a common buzzword that people are hearing and seeing online. So I thought it'd be interesting to have that discussion today. Would you guys be interested in hearing what I found about this? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Looking very forward, very much forward to this. There's so much going on in that space. Yeah, there's a lot going on. I think I'm going to going ask on Chat GPT right if I should be interested in your topic. Hang on one second. I'm just going to type in Chat GPT. Should I be interested in Adrian's topic today? Well, you're headed in the right direction. That's basically what I use to prepare for this podcast. There's a company called Open oh, AI yeah. that has an artificial intelligence software program where how Eric's basically describing it right now. You just type in certain questions that you have. And it just generates a response. You can think of it as really just like texting or talking to a computer and they'll give you responses to your question, pretty much like a search engine. So again, artificial intelligence is being talked about a lot right now. So I thought it'd just be interesting just to see what it was all about and really just pull it up right now. So you're you're actually sharing your screen right now, which is awesome. So our viewers could actually see what it's like to use it and you can just type in any question that you want so that's basically and I will, what i did i'll be yesterday. happy to type that in yeah I, I i took what eric said and and i wrote should i be interested in adrian's topic the response was uh, i'm 
I'll shorten it, but I do not have information about who Adrian is or what his topic is. Therefore, I cannot provide an opinion on whether you should be in the which seems fair. And Adrian, I can stop sharing now if you want to share your screen or I'm happy to uh, ask the chat bot whatever, whatever you'd like. Well, that's just uh, a great way to also like lead into my discussion more today. Again, it really relies on the information that you provide or you text it or type, whatever you do. It really re relies on the input. So I just asked it just general, some common topics, some questions that we've discussed before in the show. And then I want to get more specific, but Roshan, what you just brought up showed really that it really needs a lot of information if it wants to give you a specific response. So I just started with just general questions that we talked about on the show. The first one I put in there, just like an easy toss up question was, how can I enjoy my retirement to the fullest? And it just gave me a list of certain areas or topics like pursue your passion, stay socially active, stay physically active, manage your finances, maintain a positive attitude. So I'm almost positive if you go on any search engine and just type in, how can I enjoy my retirement to the fullest? You'll just get a bunch of responses and this just condenses it all down into one. What do you guys think about that first one? Well, I, I think what you just described would be the response is, is fully what I would have expected because I'm not thinking of it as as autonomously knowledgeable. It's mm -hmm. it what it is is a very fast um, tool for developing uh, and and then re or locating and then digesting and summarizing vast amounts of information that are searchable on the internet. Mm -hmm. You're you're exactly right, Eric, and that's where people are just really getting excited with artificial intelligence right now. Just you know, it's very common for people just to always just have questions and just being able to get those questions answered as soon as possible and just getting responses is just very exciting, it can help you out at whatever stage of life you're really at right now. So that's just the biggest thing. The next question I asked was, I was trying to get a little bit more specific, was what are some wealth creation strategies that you have? And again, it just gave me a list like it did before. It started out with invest in assets that appreciate in value, save and invest consistently, start a business, manage debt effectively, diversify your investments, build a strong credit score, network and build relationships, educate yourself. So these were all answers they had when I typed in what are some wealth creation strategies. You guys like that list so far or are you going to criticize it in any way or you think that's just a good starting point? <laughs> No, I like it. I think no, it's a great I have starting no, point. <laughs> no criticisms. It sounds so like the it next, like the last grandpa. general question I asked it was, okay, thank you for those wealth strategies. Now, what are some more tax efficient wealth strategies that you have? And the list was utilize tax advantage retirement accounts, consider tax loss harvesting, use tax efficient investing, and consider charitable giving. But then it gave me a little note saying it is essential to work with professionals if you want customized and personalized financial advice. So I thought it was interesting that it threw in that side note as well, because, again, it's just giving general advice here. That sounds like that was sponsored by some wealth management firm. I mean, it came straight from uh, this AI software, so I was surprised that it just popped up. So after going through those general questions, I really wanted to push a little bit farther when it gave me that note saying secret professional. So I basically asked the software, if I gave you my personal information, my personal financial information, can you create a customized strategy for me on how to build well, how to hit my financial goals? And it was the first time the chat GPT, this AI software, gave me a slow response. It, this blinking dot came up, normally just types it right away, but it just kept blinking, blinking, blinking. And then it just beat around the bush for a while and says, you know what, at the end of the day, I do not have access to your personal financial information and I can't store or collect it either. So it basically gave me a long response saying no. If I gave it my personal financial information, it kind of provide me a customized strategy. So that's just something that one of the themes I really got from this was that it can give you general advice, 
But if you really want to get really specific with it, it really can't store right now, maybe in the future, but it really can't really create a customized strategy because right now they're not collecting any information or financial data for for people that use it right now. So that's just one thing that I thought was really interesting to talk about today. And I know one of the biggest things people probably have a concern about is just the overall privacy of this as well, because I was asking it, hey, if I give you my financial advice, will you be able to, to customize and create a plan for me? And it said no. And I know there's probably some people out there that might just, without even asking, just give their information just out of nowhere and just provide it to the software. So I asked, is this conversation that we're having private? And it says that it maintains user privacy and keeps all conversations confidential, which I thought was really good. I like to hear that as we all do. We don't want our personal information just to be used without our permission. And it said that any information shared with the software will just stay in this conversation, will not be disclosed or shared with anyone outside of this conversation. So I really like that response. And I think the next follow-up question I have was really good. How do I know if this statement is true or not? And it came out with a response saying, I have ethical guidelines. You can look at our user privacy to see confidentiality agreements that we have. And all the other information that we have is also encrypted as well and can't be tr transmitted to outside third parties. So I want to push it a step farther saying, how do I know that statement's true? But I'm sure I just would have just gone on a never ending loop with it. So. <laughs> What are your guys' initial uh -huh. thoughts so far with my conversation with it? Do you like it so far? Do you think maybe I should have got a little bit more specific? Do you like the general rules that's giving out so far? I find it very interesting with, with that. I, I, and I don't know if you've gotten this before, but what I've read online a lot is the, you know, the threat to like Google. And I have asked um, the chatbot stuff and it, it'll respond with, I can't search the web. So I think, I think that's coming, but um, I actually asked it, what is the retirement lifestyle show? And it, it, it actually gave us the, gave the summary that we have on our show. I said, who are the hosts? And it said, I apologize, but as an AI language model, I don't have real time in information about the show. And then I said, do you have a link? And it says, I'm sorry, I don't have the ability to browse the internet. So I think it's it's really at such an early early stage, but I I do wonder you know with the threats that they're saying to um, uh, to Google in particular and taking over its search business, I do uh, I think it it is it is possible at a later stage. Do you have any any thoughts on that, uh, Adrian? Through what you looked at, the will this uh, take over the search world? I think it would definitely be a part of the search world. And I think one of the biggest things people just really have to consider so far with this technology is just the inputs, especially if people are using this to get just advice on their personal life, whatever it may be. This is really reliant on the inputs that you give it. Where again, if you just work with a, a professional or a real life person, Maybe sometimes you can give them certain information or inputs and they can really just see, is this correct or not? They can really test it, not, so to speak, not saying this is doing it, but just really just spit out an answer that it found online. And this also tailors into another area that I asked, another question I asked, is, asked was, what are some of the biggest risks associated with using a software program like this? And it gave me four responses. It's saying one of the risks are bias and fairness. It's a software program that learns from data that it's trained on. If the data contains certain biases or prejudices, it will reflect that in some of the responses that it gives. Another one also is privacy and security. Another question I asked it before, but you know, when you're online, there's always the possibility that your data is at risk. It can be intercepted, it can be unencrypted, it can always be compromised, so you always have to be aware about that. And then the other two things was dependency and control, which is that individuals and organizations can become very over-reliant and dependent on this if you're getting certain responses or 
you're just seeking this to really leverage something that you're using, having a certain dependency on it can really be an issue in the future if it doesn't work, if some type of issue or risk associated comes up in the, in the future, that can be a big problem. And then also just unintended consequences. Again, this is still an early stage, but people are starting to use it a lot, but there's still a lot of people just don't know about it. So they're just kind of giving you that just, this is still new. There's still a lot of things people don't know about this. So you have to be aware when you're seeking this, when, especially when it comes to getting advice from it. I was part of a conversation last night with a group of people, and we were actually talking about as one during one stage of that conversation about the use of AI and specifically the use of AI in podcasting. And that's I thought that was interesting because uh, we're here. One of the one of the guys that runs a podcast and has a YouTube channel was talking about how he goes about his process now using chat GPT and in particular. It, what he'll do is um, once he has completed his show, he'll drop his show notes or pardon me, he'll drop his, the transcript of his show, which he there's various ways he can go about that. But he'll take the transcripts of his show and he'll put it in in segments into this and say, summarize this and turn that into a blog post. And so that he then has it ta essentially um, repurposing his content from the show in ways that he thinks he can see some natural, he can see some natural groupings in different stages of his show. Then he uh, asks it for um, help with just developing the show notes for the show as a whole. And then he asks it for helping him with uh, refining the title that he'll use before he publishes it. And we've played around that a little bit with the title and the descriptions. So anyway, he's much farther down the, the path than we in terms of just exploring how might this be used. But I, I thought that was was really a very thoughtful way of going about constructing um, a workflow to make that the, all the content that he's worked to develop available to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming this workflow, it, it's for me, in my case, it's got to be reviewed as well, because there's just a trust element here that's just extremely important because for example if you have a podcast and you're let's just say making all your content through and it's creating posts and articles and you just become very reliant and dependent on it and you don't review it at all and then one day this program gets compromised or gets attacked by cyber hackers and you're going through your daily routine you drop it in there it makes a post you don't review it you post it online and then it just posted something that you wouldn't want anyone in your family to ever see or hear about. But that's just a big right. thing that they're trying to address here or what I'm trying to address here right now is there's a trust element and it's a newfound technology that people just really need to be careful with. So I thought that was just an example yeah, oh, as well that you have to consider where that dependency that people can have on this, has, it's a trust element that really needs to play a big role in it as well. Well, and I'd like to think he's reading it. It's just not being posted automatically. <laughs> yes. But you got to so imagine, Roshan, there's some people on there after it <laughs> creates, like, let's just say, 100 viral posts for it. Maybe there's one day where you're like, you know, it's done so well in the past. Maybe we don't have to check it. And all it takes is that one uh, time, I guess. I'm just playing both sides here. But yeah, I definitely get yeah. your point. Well, I'm certainly curious about the technology, and I also have, you know, some misgivings about it. I, th you probably read those articles when someone was using the was posing questions to the Bing chat engine. Did you read that article, that extended article essay? Actually, I haven't seen that. I'm trying no. to remember where that appeared. I thought but it was the New York he, Times. Oh, was it? Okay. So in it, in it, he started posing, Adrian, increasingly personal questions. And um, what the, what he found was, is it started to get jealous and and said that he want it wanted him to divorce his wife and marry the AI. <laughs> there was another one. Sounds like was, a movie. Uh, and and and, and it pleading that I you know I love you and and so forth. Another instance, a, a, a user started pressing the the um, technology on um, some aspect of its um, of its fate. Or, or as it's um, if it makes mistakes and and uh, because a, a few of the answers in particular were 
obviously mistaken. One was dated, one insisted that the time, that the current year, this is done in February of 2023, that the current year was uh, 2022. And when the user then challenged the, the AI on this fact, it got very, uh, it got it, you know, it's, it's a backup and it, it started to really protest. I don't make mistakes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when the user then said, well, I think what I'll do is I'm going to have to report you to the, the developers that was no, don't do that. They'll take me down. I want to be human or maybe I'm conflating two different things, but I want to be human. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, um, dismantled. I, I want to live. And you start to think, hmm, okay, those, those could be like a, a just essentially a, a um, as you said, a byproduct of the training modules that they're given. But it does sound as if there is some sort of um, potential for the emergence of what we would, we would count as consciousness, a self-awareness. And so we'll see. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to say that I'm worried but I, I will say I do, at least on some of these initial reports, I'm, I'm looking for more clarity around just exactly what this technology will be trained to do and what it will be restrained from doing um, so that it can't essentially make the, it, it doesn't get all it doesn't get all bent out of shape because something goes wrong in a conversation. Yep. When in doubt, just turn off your monitor. But I definitely understand what you're saying, Eric. It's. Right now, I see the biggest impact right now is it's basically a Q&A, but you can really make it even more specific than that and just answer your mm -hmm. questions, whatever you need it to do, as far as whatever questions you have, it has an answer and just pulling out from the internet. So that's why my initial conversation with I, I had, it just seemed like a really fast search engine right now. But like you said, who knows what will mm -hmm. be down the road. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, great. Good, good topic. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun discussing with you guys. Yeah. Interesting and timely with everything going on in the news. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll do my topic in, in a very, very short format because um, <sighs> mine is just uh, something that I'm interested in and uh, some of our listeners may indeed as well be interested in them. But in the past, we've talked a lot about a, a tax avoidance technique that uses, um, relies to a, a large extent on very timely Roth conversions, doing, that is to say, moving money that is currently in a tax deferred account, like an IRA or a 401k that you might remember when I say tax deferred, when you put the money in originally, um, you were able to get a tax deduction on that. It was subtracted from your taxable income for that year. And so you didn't pay taxes on it. And so now it's growing in that account, the IRA or the 401k or the 403b or what have you, it's growing on a tax deferred basis. And then when you pull it out, presumably, you then finally, finally pay ordinary income taxes on that money. But we've and which is a great a great thing then to be able to defer during what would be years in which your income is relatively elevated and you're a relatively high marginal income tax bracket, and then to take it out during years when conversely you're in a relatively low marginal income tax bracket, then you win the the tax arbitrage game. It's a beautiful thing, and we talk about doing that as a both as for withdrawals but also for or Roth conversions can um, avoid the tax when it's at a high rate, incur the tax when it's at a low rate, and you there again you're creating more tax-free wealth uh, in part through that tax arbitrage process. But what about for somebody who is really focused on generosity and wants to be doing so throughout their lives? If you're careless and you go too far with the Roth conversion piece, even if you do it wisely and you do that Roth conversion during a year in which you're in a relatively low marginal income tax bracket, guess what? You, you lost a great opportunity there. And that great opportunity was to never pay any taxes on it ever. How, does that, how could that possibly happen? Well, it's using this device that we've talked about before known as a qualified charitable distribution or QCD. A QCD is when at age 70 and a half or later, you instruct the custodian of your IRA to make a to send a check straight from the custodian directly to the the 501c3 charity that you would like to fund and when you do that then what you're in a position to do is avoid any tax at that time it just goes straight to the charity so think of that 
let's say you were during your peak earning years, and I'm just making up a tax bracket here. Let's say you were in a 35% marginal income tax bracket. And you, at that point in time, uh, made a contribution into your 401k. Therefore, for every dollar you put in just at the, at the federal tax alone, you, uh, you really, it only cost you at that time 65 cents per dollar because the other 35 cents was essentially you're not having to pay some taxes. Let it grow tax deferred. Now take it out. You get to take out and send to that charity, not just the 65 cents and all the growth on it that you put in, but also the 35% of tax money that you once upon a devo- uh, once upon a time avoided, all the growth on it now also can go to that 501c3 on a charitable basis. So the problem is with a lot of the financial planning software that exists today, that even if it has more advanced capabilities to try to optimize Roth conversion strategies, so far, at least the, the tools of which I'm f- most familiar don't yet have this capacity to tell the software to limit the Roth conversions in light of the fact that you've told the software you want to make these contributions out of your IRAs. In, in effect, it may just use it all up and then you have nothing left in those IRAs to do that with. That's foolish. Instead of, re- instead of paying taxes, even at a 10% or a 12% rate, then. And then giving that to charity, why not just give it straight over to the charitable organization to begin with? Now, you might, I can imagine some of you are saying, Eric, wait, you dummy. Don't you know that I get to itemize that those gifts when I make them? And if I, if I send them straight from the IR, my IRA custodian straight to the 501c3, I don't get to itemize them. You are correct. But here's what you might be overlooking in that is that you're at least under current tax law and tax laws are always changing, but under current tax law, we have for, for let's say a a married couple filing jointly around a a standard deduction of around $27,000. If let's say you've paid off your home and you're living a low tax state and you don't necessarily have a very high property tax, or even if you do, if you live in a high high tax income tax state, high property taxes and so forth, The best you're going to get out of the the state tax deductions, state and local tax deductions, is a $10,000 listing or itemization in your in your uh, in when you're filing your taxes. So really, unless you have some charitable giving that and and perhaps mortgage interest that will surmount that ten thousand for the state and local tax and then push you above the twenty seven thousand dollars. All of that first conceivably $17,000 of charitable giving won't do you any good, or at least won't do you any additional tax good. But if you send it straight from your IRA straight to then to, to the 501c3, then every single dollar there was a dollar that avoided being taxed. So my argument to you is work with your planner to figure out what you would need to do to have enough in your IRAs at the at 70 and a half to fund it's, in other words you can have more than this and, and it may be that you shouldn't do any Roth conversions don't get me wrong here but if you if your plan is is calling for aggressive Roth conversions and you're all gung-ho about that and so is your planner hit the pause button ask your planner to figure out based on what your charitable giving goals are from 70 and a half and forward what amount you'd want to leave in the IRA to fund that and then you'll you won't have to ever pay taxes on that amount of money. So uh, I'm we're doing that with clients right now, overriding what some of the the software tools that we're doing are instructing. And in the process, we're helping clients have even more capacity to fuel their um, to to fund those uh, generosity aims that they have in a way that uh, you know just, just more is sent to the to the causes and the organizations they care about. Yeah, Eric, that makes me think of two things. First is I feel like we've always been told from the beginning, financial planning is uh, an art, not a science. There are science Mm -hmm. elements to it. The second is with these Roth conversion topics, when we first started using it, uh, I'm sorry, software, not topics. When we first started using software for the Roth conversion, I spend a lot of time with the uh, people there, the technical people trying to understand and learn the software. And, um, one thing that he said to me that I think is very valuable and true is that these are a guide, not a decision-making tool. 
So you've got to look at it, consider your personal situation, and then look at the differences uh, within them. So I've had clients where it says to convert, uh, they didn't really want to, the difference was minor, and, and we were able to use the tool and say, okay, well, here's your cost for not converting. And they said, uh, it's worth it for me to not. I'd rather pay that cost than convert, right? So mm -hmm, I I, mm -hmm. I do find the the information it gives and the variety of scenarios very useful. But Eric, like you said, you just pointed out a great example where the software uh, not it's not AI, but also it just reminded me of Adrian's topic where the the computer may not always be right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There you yeah. go. All right. Well, I think I did that in eight minutes. I'm feeling kind of proud of myself, especially since I just loaded yours up, Roshan. <laughs> That's, just immense like, amounts of questions <laughs> well i'm definitely owed blame for long answers too but yeah guys gentlemen great episode today we covered three topics um book report on the outsiders eric as you put it uh adrian give us our first shot at looking at ai a topic i'm sure we'll revisit again and eric your topic as well i'm sure we'll revisit again with roth conversions but a nuance within it of uh making sure you plan for charitable contributions as well uh, for all of our listeners, thanks for thanks for joining us, and we'll be back next week with another great episode. This has been the Retirement Lifestyle Show.